Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I hope you're, hope you're all feeling very well. Uh, and I can hold this microphone close enough to hear. Can you not hear now? Sorry. A bit muffled. Oh, sorry. Oh. <laughs> sorry, I'll, you'll get to see my hair now. Um, and the fact I forgot to shave, so that's not a, a very good start. <laughs> um, I did forget I'd be up here. Uh, very quickly before we start, uh, I will um, just go through the COVID rules at the moment. Um, you are seated in an allocated space and we ask that you remain there until the end of the service. Um, please keep your mask on at all times uh, and try to touch as little as possible around you. If you do happen to feel unwell, can you just make yourself known, raise your hand, uh, uh, attract the minister's attention or one of the elders and we'll see you out. And yes, the toilet, <laughs> not like that. Um, the, toilet, the toilet is available um, should you need to use it, but it is a restricted access, so please make sure no one's there um, when you go. Um, that means hanging about outside the door. Um, and at the end of the service, I'll just quickly run through it. I'm sure you'll remember and you are familiar now. Can you please wait in your pew until you're asked to leave by one of the elders? Um, the central section will come out first and so forth. Uh, you will be indicated when it's safe to, when it's suitable to leave, shall we say. You will be leaving by the side door. Please don't congregate. Uh, we don't want to have a build up uh, in any particular area, so please maintain that social distancing on the way out. Uh, very quickly, some intimations for you. Uh, there is a lack of children here today. Um, that's because they're at the Sunday club, so if you have children um, and you wish to come to church, there is a Sunday club available. It meets down at the Castle Visitor Centre at 10.45. There's also, uh, we've got a group for teenagers as well, and they go for a nice walk in the woods through that time. So if you've got teenagers, you can do that. There is a display I'm sure you've noticed outside the church just now, which is uh, a Good Samaritans display. Some of them from the school that I've put up there are very entertaining. Um, so please go and have a read of them. Um, and you can also take part in that Good Samaritans. You can go down to the manse. There's a box outside with some uh, leaflets there. Uh, you can take one and fill one out and post it back through the manse door. Uh, we do have a food bank in the village now, which is fantastic news after a long time of waiting. And that is open on a Monday from 10 until 12. That's at the Montgomery Hall. Uh, so that's available for you. Um, very briefly, COVID update. Um, on Tuesday, uh, our leadership team in the government will be reviewing uh, all of the levels. Currently, we expect on the 19th of July, we'll reduce to level zero for the whole of Scotland. That's currently the plan, which is great news. That means we get social distancing down to one meter. And also we, I think most importantly for everyone, we get to sing in church again albeit with a mask, but it's, it's a great step forward. And looking further forward, all going well, 9th of August, all restrictions will be lifted. That's the plan as of today. As we know, after the last 18 months, it's um, subject to change. Uh, one last wee intimation from me. If you've seen the church's brown bin, or if it's accidentally went in uh, to your garden round about here, can you please return it? It's, it's vanished. Uh, and last of all, it's a great pleasure for me, uh, while our Minister Lindsay is on holiday, to introduce uh, a welcome back, uh, Reverend Alistair Symington, who's joining us again, I'm sure. We're all thrilled to see him filling in this week. So, welcome, Alistair. Can you? Thank you very much, Bob. And can I say what a great joy it is for me to be back here in Dundonald Parish. It was a very special part of my life when I was with you for two years, and it's great to be back. I was going to say, it's great to see familiar faces. <laughs> <laughs> but I've got to make a guess at the eyes now. <laughs> but nonetheless, it's good to see you and to be worshipping with you. And it's also good to have Willie singing for us, and we're going to open our worship with a psalm, Lord, from the depths to thee I cried.
David the psalmist said, unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain that build it. Let us pray. Almighty and eternal Father, once more we bow before you in joyful worship. We remember you as our great creator God, you who fashioned us to be loved and to love. We remember you as our great redeemer God, you who in Jesus Christ lived our life and died our death and won our victory so that even now the gates of heaven are flung wide open to offer us an eternal home. We remember you, the Holy Spirit, you who are that breath of life moving through this otherwise dead and distraught world to offer us that peace which passes all understanding. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God in a glorious trinity, we praise your name. And forgiving God, we also bow before you now. You know us better than we know ourselves. We build our lives on sand. We rely on our own weaknesses to usher us through the days. We feel so clever when we are proved to be right. And we treat you all too often as a passing interest. Father, forgive us and allow us to let you build us up once more. Try and try and try again as we do without you. We only fail. But with you beside us, all things are possible. So forgive us and rebuild our lives better to conform with your image for us. Bless now this moment of worship. May our songs be filled with praise, our minds turned towards you, and our hearts open to receive your call. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, in whose words we pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now we listen to our Bible reading. You are disobeying the Lord's commands and worshipping the idols of Baal. Now order all the people of Israel to meet me at Mount Carmel. Bring along the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of the goddess Asherah, who are supported by Queen Jezebel. So Ahab summoned all the Israelites and the prophets of Baal to meet at Mount Carmel. Elijah went up to the people and said, How much longer will it take you to make up your minds? If the Lord is God, worship him. But if Baal is God, worship him. But the people didn't say a word. Then Elijah said, I am the only prophet of the Lord still left, but there are 450 prophets of Baal. Bring two bulls. Let the prophets of Baal take one. Kill it. Cut it into pieces and put it on the wood, but don't light the fire. I will do the same with the other bull. Then let the prophets of Baal pray to their God, and I will pray to the Lord, and the one who answers by sending fire. He is God. The people shouted their approval. New Testament reading, Romans chapter 8, 
verses 31 to 39. God's love in Christ Jesus. In view of all this, what can we say? If God is for us, we can, who can be against us? Certainly not God, who did not even keep back his own son, but offered him for us all. He gave us his son. Will he not also freely give us all things? Who will accuse God's chosen people? God himself declares them not guilty. Who then will condemn them? Not Christ Jesus, who died, or rather, who was raised to life and is at the right hand side of God, pleading with him for us. Who then can separate us from the Lord, the love of Christ? Can trouble do it, or hardship, or persecution, or hunger, or poverty, or danger, or death? As the scripture says, for your sake, we are in danger of death at all times. We are treated like sheep that are going to the slaughter. No, in all these things, we have complete victory through him who loved us. For I am certain that nothing can separate us from his love. Neither death nor life, neither angels nor other heavenly rulers or powers, neither the present nor the future, neither the world above nor the world below. There is nothing in all creation that will ever be able to separate us from the love of God, which is ours through Christ Jesus our Lord. And John chapter 7, verses 1 to 18. Jesus and his brothers. After this, Jesus traveled to Galilee. He did not want to travel to Judea because the Jewish authorities there were wanting to kill him. The time for the festival of shelters was near. So Jesus' brothers said to him, leave this place and go to Judea so that your followers will see the things that you are doing. No one hides what he is doing if he wants to be well known. Since you are doing these things, let the whole world know about you. Not even his brothers believed in him. Jesus said to them, the right time for me has not yet come. Any time is right for you. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I keep telling it that its ways are bad. You go on to the festival. I am not going to this festival because the right time has not come for me. He said this and then stayed on in Galilee. After his brothers had gone to the festival, Jesus also went. However, he did not go openly, but secretly. The Jewish authorities were looking for him at the festival. Where is he? They asked. There was much whispering about him in the crowd. He is a good man, some people said. No, others said. He is misleading the people. But no one talked about him openly because they were afraid of the Jewish authorities. The festival was nearly half over when Jesus went to the temple and began teaching. The Jewish authorities were greatly surprised and said, how does this man know so much when he has never had any training? Jesus answered, what I teach is not my own teaching, but it comes from God who sent me. Whoever is willing to do what God wants will know whether what I teach comes from God or whether I speak on my own authority. A person who speaks on his own authority is trying to gain glory for himself, but he who wants glory for the one who sent him is honest, and there is nothing false in him. May God bless this reading from his holy word. Thank you. And now we continue our worship in the hymn, Saviour, again, to thy dear name we raise.
In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. These words we heard in the first book of the Kings, chapter 18, at verse 21. This is the Revised Standard Version. Elijah came near to all the people and said, How long will you go limping with two different opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. Indecision, uncertainty, an unwillingness to commit to something and then stick to it. These are issues as timeless as history. They were relevant back then, and they are relevant now. And Elijah's simple challenge has to be heard. And it has to be heard because we live in times when limping with different opinions is very much the order of the day. Having your cake and eating it, shifting your ground to suit whoever is listening without any reference to basic standards on which you try to build your life. And that was Israel's problem. There was something rotten in their society, a malaise gnawing at the peace of the individual, and people suspected it. And I think the king also understood it to be the issue, for there was a discontent running through the country and the feeling that something wasn't right. People looked back. They recalled yesterday when hopes were high and ideals were in place and it was a world of promise and expectation. They looked back and they saw the brave old world of promise and expectation. They looked back and told their children what they remembered with pride. And Elijah was their leader in faith and in religion. And what he said changed people then. And it has the power to change people now. Because what Elijah did was take them back to basics. He looked at them. He knew the way Israel was going. He knew what they were hankering for. And he knew the sorts of conversations people were having in the streets or in their homes. He saw what they thought of God. And the more he listened, the more he was able to identify what was wrong. Till the day came at Carmel and it was time to face up to the whole situation. Truth or falsehood? Or maybe more accurately, truth and pretense? Truth and compromise? Truth and delusion? But it was the day to bring matters to a head. And it was a setting so typical of these ancient days. People gathered with a sense of curiosity, feeling something was going to happen. There were 400 members of an alternative religion devoted to Baal. There were members of the court of King Ahab and Queen Jezebel, who were themselves both present. And there was a lone figure, the prophet I Elijah, who somehow come. But I know that tomorrow you want something else. Put Sunday's religion away because it tends to get in the way and plump for another sort, a religion that panders to your baser elements in life, that plays with your superstition, that legitimizes what's immoral, that deep down, if you have a second to be honest, you inside you know is inadequate. So how long are you going to go on like that? How long will you limp through your life with two different opinions, two different value indicators because it doesn't work it's turning you into spiritual schizophrenics one day sure of the faith the next lip service to it and back to the compromises which stitch together most of your sorry life so how long asked the prophet how long if the lord is god then follow him but if it's baal then please go and follow him. Don't bother with church. Don't try to fool people. And then there follows the story of the struggle on Mount Carmel. The prophet taking on the 450 
and convinced, as St. Paul many centuries later was, that nothing can ever separate us from the love of God, which was expressed in that passage we heard written to the church in Rome. Convinced and persuaded that God was king. So who cared about odds of 450 to 1? For all these 450 had was the empty nonsense of their mythology. So Elijah stood alongside God at Carmel, and he assembled people, priests, and the royal household. Went home that night having seen a miracle and with something pretty significant to think about. So it's an epic story. An ordinary man, a prophet, but so strong and so gentle because the love of God was embedded in his heart. And he stood among other ordinary people and set them an inescapable challenge. He laid bare for them the facts of faith. He cut away the excuses which pile up round so much religious practice that you begin to despair of people ever taking a proper look at religion again. And then you move on and you see that's exactly what Jesus did. Again, the message was so simple. It was about the love of God for all of us, about the forgiveness of God for all of us, about the promises of God we shall all inherit, about the challenge of God to live now not as sons and daughters of the gutter, but as sons and daughters who have been called to live a new life. And you know what was best of all? Jesus practiced what he preached, unlike so many others around him whose limping with two opinions had reached massive proportions of self-deceit. And so Jesus made a, an impact, and it caused trouble. And it wasn't that the people didn't understand. The trouble was that they did understand, and they didn't like what they heard because it put at risk so much of their shallow life. So Jesus told them, in effect, that they were cripples. On the one hand, they wanted to hold on to the faith of their fathers. But on the other hand, not too deeply because they enjoyed the sleek sins which gave them fun and sometimes feathered their nests. And these people were called Pharisees and they were called Sadducees. But the truth was that they were much as much the followers of Baal as anyone else could be. And Jesus exposed them. He said to them, you can't claim God in one breath and in the next live a lie. You can't own the open offer of God's love available to all, but then grab hold of your seedy mythology and dirty lifestyle and marry the two together. It doesn't work. If the Lord is God, then follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And Mount Carmel became Calvary. And a new contest was fought, the prophet against the world. And we can't avoid that. It's no good to say that these were yesterday's battles. And all that I've said so far is just of passing historic interest. That doesn't work. We don't have to look very far to identify so much in this village, my town, let alone in the church and in our society, where men and women are limping, crippled by compromise. It's not for me as a minister to tell people what to think and how to come to terms with their lives, but it surely is still the task of the preacher to encourage people to look and to think, and to come to their own conclusions. So sure, you can, you can see the prophets of Baal today. You see the latter-day Pharisees and Sadducees in this village here or in any town in the land. You see them on TV. You observe them in politics and in business. You see them not garbed now in priestly robes, but you see them as ordinary people, some of them famous and some of them are unknown. You see them in people who shout about their rights in a society 
which fuels us to think about our rights, but almost never now talks about our responsibility. You see them in people who cut corners in their place of work and make a virtue out of cheating the system. You see them in tax dodgers. You see them in young people who are being raised to think that life is a round of pleasure and they have no need to think of their neighbor anymore. You see them in homes which are being torn apart because of selfishness. You see them in people in public life who crave our trust but are consumed by a culture of deceit. You see them all around, and they are the false prophets and rogue priests of today. And the prophet Christ stands as the trouble of, troubler of Israel still, the troubler of here, and tells us perhaps you are limping. And for how long? How long can we do it? How long to limp with two different opinions? And you see them in the church as well. As they had infiltrated the temple and the synagogue in Christ's time and had tried to compromise religion in Elijah's time, so these same sorts are evident today. And we, we can look back with a longing eye as they did in Israel of old and hanker for the good old days. We can talk of the times that we remember when churches were full and Christian morality was predominant. But the new bail has caught the headlines Maybe in preachers who don't believe the message anymore, so they purvey doubt far more than they're readily willing to offer the good news of the gospel, which is the essence of our faith. You see them in churches which close their doors to the deprived and the poor and the outcast because such people might cause more trouble than they're worth. People who sing their songs and pray their prayers and then live life as if they hadn't meant any of what they had said. You see them. And they are as dangerous as Elijah believed them to be in his own time when he met them at Carmel. Quiet and cunning. Very often they're nice people. Sometimes they offer the right phrase to make you think that they're on side with you. But in our midst, we have false prophets who need to be challenged. But finally, don't just look outwards. Don't only try to see in others where Baal or the Pharisee or the Sadducee are found. Check out ourselves. It can be so easy to get caught up in it, to get brought into Baal's flow. It can happen without even thinking that suddenly our standards have shifted and our priorities have changed and our attitudes have become compromised, and our commitment has become less, and our love has become conditional, and we are slipping away from being Christ's. And Jesus warns us to keep guard. Don't keep looking at the wee skelf in your brother or sister's eye when there's a big log in your own. Yesterday, you walk tall and proud and strong for Jesus, Today you're limping, so face up to the choice yourself as well. It is a vital choice, and it's not a gambler's choice. Elijah's odds were 450 to 1, but he wasn't gambling. He knew his God. We here in church this morning, we know our God, and we have seen his Christ, and we've been moved and touched by his Spirit. So there is no need to limp. If you want Baal, then have him. Choose him and see if he can unlock the enigmas of life for you. But if not, choose Christ again. Choose the Lord who lived and forgave and saved his people. Choose the Christ who died for you and in dying has conquered death forever. Choose the faith that can speak to your deepest wants. Choose the road that's going to take you to the very gates of heaven and then beyond. Choose that and then follow. 
and I know for a fact you will be blessed and happy beyond your wildest dreams. And Baal and his followers, they're done. They're on history's scrapyard together with their failed and their failing promises. Amen. May God bless to us this preaching of his own most holy word and to his name be the praise and the glory. Let us pray. Father God, day after day you stretch out your hand to us in blessing and offer us gifts without number. We thank you for your immense generosity. And in token of that generosity, we ask you to receive our small gifts brought before you now. Take them into your possession, and through your church, turn them into new gifts of love and service to further your kingdom. Hear, too, the prayers of this people offered for those with whom we share life and share this generation. Encourage all of us to step back from these elements that defile and despoil and to step forward to new enterprises for the sake of the kingdom. And so we ask you to encourage us to do whatever we can to alleviate the sorrows and burdens which so often people like us help to create. Remove the passions that cause strife, not only among nations but among ordinary people. Strip from us the selfishness that can turn a blind eye to poverty and to suffering and allow us to work with renewed energy to make for a better sharing of this world's resources. Teach us again to love as you have loved us. And so in that spirit, we pray for our families and our friends. And we ask that we might always look on them with that same kindness and tenderness as you offer us in Jesus Christ, your Son. Bless our Queen and all who exercise authority under her. May we flourish as one nation, united in a common goal. I thank you, Father God, for the great host who now belong to that mighty church triumphant in heaven, and especially for those whom we still love, but who are joyously alive in your presence. Thank you for giving them to us here for a while. And thank you for offering them the joys of eternal life. Unite us with them in spirit till that day comes when we are reunited with them in life everlasting. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns, is worshipped and glorified with you, the Father, and the Holy Spirit, one God, world without end. Amen. And now we close our worship by singing, by hearing the hymn, Take My Life, Lord, Let It Be.
into God's gracious care and keeping, I commit you. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Amen. <laughs>